another free YouTube tutorial video. This time around, we're going to be talking about the concept of synergies in M&A deals. And specifically here, we're going to be using this example of this deal from earlier in the year between Men's Warehouse and Joseph A. Bank. So this was roughly a $1.8 billion deal between two men's specialty retailers. And the reason why we're looking at it here is because this is a perfect example of a deal that was motivated almost entirely or primarily we could say because of synergies now what are synergies exactly and why do they matter we're going to start off with a brief discussion of this and examples of synergies we're going to go into a specific example with numbers and then we're going to look at three common mistakes that people often make when they incorporate synergies into merger models where you analyze what happens when one company buys another one and how their earnings per share of the buyer is impacted after the fact. So synergies, put simply, are cases where 1 plus 1 equals 3 in M&A scenarios. And this is a very fitting illustration of what exactly synergies are. So put simply, you take two companies and then you get more revenue than just the buyer's revenue plus the seller's revenue or you get less in expenses than just the buyer's expenses plus the seller's expenses. So going to our merger model here, for example, you can see the buyer's revenue and the seller's revenue here over five years. Well, if we have synergies, we don't just add these up and get to 3.6 billion and 3.7 and 3.8 billion in revenue. Maybe we have 50 million extra or 100 million extra or 150 million extra. And these count as revenue synergies, and these result in the total revenue being greater than just the buyer's revenue plus just the seller's revenue added together. So that's one example. How this could come up in real life is maybe the acquirer buys the seller and now can sell more of its products to the seller's customers, or maybe it can sell its products in a new geography, or the seller can sell some of its products or services to a new customer base. Revenue synergies actually tend to be very difficult to estimate and can be very error prone. Sometimes they matter and sometimes you can calculate them more precisely, but in most models and in most scenarios, you are actually more focused on expense synergies. They are more grounded in reality because you're basing these on what the companies are currently spending and you're deciding what can actually be cut. So going back to our model here, for example, if you look at something like the operating expense synergies in this model, which we'll get into in a little bit, the 11 to 12 million all the way up to the 74 million here, these are all based on what both companies are currently spending on selling general and administrative expenses and then their rental expenses as well. Because for retail companies like this, rent, of course, is very, very important and significant. So we're not just pulling this number out of thin air, we're saying, this is based on what you are currently spending, and we think that you can cut a certain percentage of that spending. So unlike with revenue synergies, we don't just mysteriously get these numbers that may or may not come to fruition. They're at least based on something real and based on current spending levels and how they're expected to change in the future. Now, a concrete example of this would be, let's say that two companies that are merging both have offices in New York City. Now, if you think about it, if they are one company after the fact, they probably don't need two separate offices. And they might be able to consolidate these offices to reduce their expenses. So let's say that office number one costs 500,000 per year in rent, and then office number two costs $400,000 per year in rent. Maybe if they combine forces, the two companies together could get a new bigger office that costs $700,000 in rent, and that, of course, would save them $200,000 per year because instead of paying $900,000 per year combined for the two offices separately, they can now consolidate into one office and pay only $700,000 per year, saving $200,000. So that would be a simple example of synergies. And there are other more complex examples. In this deal, for example, if we go to the very end of the investor presentation given on this deal and possible areas for synergies, they have a couple of estimates in their own presentation. For example, they go through this analysis of some of the different categories of spending for the company, such as general and merchandise accounting, inventory control, FP&A, accounts payable, 
travel and entertainment expenses, and they go through and say that they think they can eliminate a certain number of employees for each of those functions, and based on that, they can save a certain amount based on how much they're paying those employees currently. So that's another way that you could estimate something like this. And the reason why all this matters is because some deals require synergies to actually look good on paper. In other words, to actually boost the buyer's earnings per share. And so they're very dependent on synergies actually being realized. And some deals are actually motivated primarily by synergies, such as the one that we are looking at right here. And just to see what an impact these have, if you go in and you delete something like the OPEX synergies, the operating expense synergies, and then the cost of goods sold synergies, for example, you can see what a big impact that has on the deal. Earnings per share and the accretion dilution here, right now, without those synergies, it's negative in the first three years. And on a pro forma basis, it's slightly positive by around 3%, 7%, 8%. But when we have those synergies in place, look at how much this changes. Now, it actually turns very positive in years two and three. And then on a pro forma basis, it is very positive in year one, year two, year three, and beyond. So it makes a pretty substantial difference in this deal. And that is why it's so important to analyze these more closely, because it changes your perception of the deal and how favorable it is to both the buyer and the seller. And if you're an investment banker advising one or both of these companies, it's going to change the type of advice that you give them. Now, the problem with synergies is that a lot of people get it wrong when it comes to three main areas. The first problem that we often see with synergies is that there isn't much detail given on what they actually consist of. So people will go in and say, we have $100 million of synergies or $50 million of synergies, but they never back it up with what those actually consist of. The second problem is that synergies take time to realize. A lot of people in models like this will just say, okay, we have 50 million of synergies per year every single year until the end of time. But synergies will always take time to realize, and if you don't account for that, your model is gonna be less accurate. And then finally, synergies cost money to realize. And a lot of people overlook this and they think that you can just combine two companies with hundreds or thousands of locations, thousands or tens of thousands of employees, and it'll be free. It'll cost no money to actually do all this. But of course, in real life, things always cost money. And so you have to factor in the money required to realize these synergies as well. Let's look at the first area here, the lack of granular estimates, and take a look at what is going on here. So with this one, what I've often seen before is that even in very complex models, people will have very, very simple assumptions for synergies. No, I don't mean to pick on anyone, but I'm going to show you this model here from a source that will remain nameless. But it's a fairly complex merger model overall. It has support for combining all three financial statements. The problem, though, is that if you look at the assumptions that they have for synergies here, they're very simplistic. They basically only allow you to enter lump sum values for cost savings, capex, revenue synergies, and there isn't much detail given on where these are coming from. Are these coming from employees that are no longer there? Are they coming from consolidated buildings or offices? Are they coming from increased unit sales or increased pricing on the revenue side? And they don't really have any detail to back this up. Now you have to ask yourself, if this model could be so complex and offer so many different capital structures and so many other options on the deal itself and what the combined company looks like, why would they have so little detail on the expense synergy side? And again, I'm not trying to pick on them or the authors of this, but the point is we'd like to come up with something that's a little bit more grounded in reality. If the model is going to be that complicated, why not at least come up with something a little more sophisticated for the synergies? So in this case, we actually have it very easy because the company gives us their estimates for all the synergies. They say 100 to 150 million, and they don't just stop there. They give the sample breakout of the employees that they could cut in each area. And then they also give us synergies broken out by each of their main expense categories right here. Now, this is still pretty high level because we're not getting into the exact ways that we can realize synergies in all these areas. But even this is better than just having a lump sum dollar amount. So this is definitely an improvement. And the other thing that we could do is in addition to listing synergies by all these different areas, we could also take a look at 
the percentages of the total combined cost of goods sold and combined operating expenses that these synergies represent, which I've done here. These percentages are very reasonable. If it were something more like 10% or 20%, that would be extremely aggressive and we would question that. But something in the 5% or less range is generally reasonable in a deal like this, especially if it takes many years to get there. We can also look at, for example, the implied number of stores that would be closed if we take the company's cost savings in the stores category and we divide it by the average expense per store. And here that only comes out to about 1.3% of the total stores that would be closed, which again strikes us as reasonable. So that's just a little bit of checking that you can do to make sure that these numbers actually line up with what makes sense in real life. Now, the other point I'm going to mention here is that in real life, if you're a banker advising these companies, you don't really know enough to get these numbers yourself. You have to consult with the CFOs of both companies and their finance departments to get the estimates. They're the only ones that are going to be able to go through employee by employee and actually give you those precise numbers. But the point is, even if you can't come up with it yourself, you want to try to find a source for these more precise estimates for the expense synergies in a deal like this. So that's pitfall number one, not having granular enough numbers and not checking your numbers to foot them with reality and see what they represent. Now pitfall number two is that it takes time to realize synergies. Now sometimes with this, again, going back to that other model I was showing you, I really don't want to pick on them, but this is just what I had available and it illustrates the point that I was making. They don't have any support built in for the fact that synergies often take time to realize. So they just sort of have a lump sum dollar amount listed in each year here. And they do say up here, okay, year one synergies, and they sort of assume after that that each year it's going to be exactly the same. The problem is that in real life that doesn't really happen because when two companies merge, it's not as if you can just pretend to be the Death Star and now suddenly you just destroy everything in your site and you instantly wipe out all the employees you don't need, you reshuffle departments and you move everything around. It doesn't really work like that. There is no Death Star in real life. You can't just enact changes that quickly. What you have to do instead is assume that it takes some amount of time to realize these synergies. Even if you're doing something as simple as laying off a certain number of staff members or employees, it's still going to take time to do that, to figure out severance packages, to do all the setup and all that. And then if you're doing something like consolidating buildings or you're changing around how the company processes or purchases inventory, that's going to take even more time. And a lot of bankers overlook this because they have no experience running a company or a business of any size. And so they think it's easy to change all these processes overnight or that it takes no time to actually put these synergies into effect. Now here, once again, the company makes it easy because what they do is in their presentation, they actually give the estimate synergy timing by season right here. And they say that it's probably going to take at least two to three to four years to realize 100% of the synergies that they have estimated. And in the beginning, they realize a relatively small percentage of the total amount that they'll eventually realize. They claim over 100 million here. So what we've done in our model is we've incorporated this in the form of this percent synergy realized figure over here. And we've said that for cost of goods sold and operating expenses, they start out by realizing only 16% of the total, and then 50%, then 85%, and then they only get to 100% in years four and five right here. What is the impact of this? Well, going back to our merger model, this is going to make the deal look less accretive in the early years because it takes longer to realize these. And what ends up happening is that we get a more realistic picture of what the accretion dilution to the buyer would really look like because we don't get all those synergies up front at once in the model. So that's just something to keep in mind as you go through and you review models and then you start creating your own and you start seeing what other people do. It definitely takes time to realize synergies and if you leave this out, we would argue that your model is not as good or correct as it should be. Now the third oversight here is that it takes money to realize synergies. It's not free to consolidate buildings or to shuffle people around. There are going to be costs associated with all that, with training employees to work in different groups, with preparing one person to take over the job of two people that did it previously. So there are always going to be expenses associated with that. And again, a lot of bankers don't realize this or they simplify it and leave it out because they haven't actually had experience running a company and doing this. 
Often you will see items like restructuring costs or integration costs or items with similar names and that's what this is referring to. Now it doesn't have to be referring to just realizing synergies. This could actually just be the cost of integrating both companies. Forget about synergies. What about the cost of just putting together two companies and centralizing all their accounting systems, all their purchasing and inventory systems and all that. Now this expense could show up on the income statement or it could be a cash flow statement expense or it could be both. It really depends on the deal and the type of expenses here. Now in this case, once again, the company makes it relatively easy for us because if you keep scrolling down in this presentation, they say right here that they're going to be the so-called one-time integration costs of 100 million over the next 18 months. Now they label this as a cash flow item. So we consider it a part of the company's cash flow statement. And if you look at what we do over here, we include it as integration costs. We have one third in the first year and then two thirds in the next year. And then in our merger model, this doesn't show up on the income statement, but what does happen is that it shows up on our mini cash list statement and in our debt repayment schedule. And the fact that we have these integration costs here, it pushes down the cash flow available for debt repayment. This deal is primarily funded with debt. And so what ends up happening is as a re direct result of these integration costs, we repay less debt in years one and two. And so the company's interest expense on the income statement will be higher in those earlier years, which means that it'll be less accretive and a more dilutive deal overall. Now to see an example of that, notice how the net interest expense is around 105 to 110 million right now. Well, if we go in and delete these integration costs, now our interest expense falls in the second year to only 103 million. So there is definitely an impact from not being able to repay quite as much debt. Maybe not a huge impact, but there is some impact and we do want to track this in this model. So that's it for pitfall number three, the fact that it takes money to realize synergies and the fact that you have to be aware of whether this expense is going to show up on the income statement, the cash flow statement, both or just one of those and how it's going to flow through the rest of the model. So how does all this impact the deal, the accretion dilution figures, and so on and so forth? We've already been over many of these points, but the main one is that if you factor in the money and the time that are required, it's always going to make the deal less accretive or more dilutive. Why is that? On the income statement, you're not going to realize 100% of those synergies up front, so the combined pre-tax income is going to be lower in those earlier years. It's going to take years to get that increase, so the earlier years are less accretive. Now on the cash flow statement, if the integration or restriction costs show up here, it's going to reduce how much cash flow the company can use to repay debt with, and that in turn means that their interest expense on the income statement is going to be higher or that their interest income from cash is going to be lower if they are not using debt, they don't have any debt, and it's strictly a cash-based deal. And that is also going to make the deal less accretive. So that's a little bit about the topic of expense synergies. Let's do a quick recap and summary. Now, synergies overall are cases where 1 plus 1 equals 3 after a deal closes. And I think this visual illustrates pretty well exactly what synergies are. So you get more revenue than expected or lower expenses than expected. This could be due to, due to cross-selling or upselling, or it could be due to consolidation or inventory or purchase efficiencies or staff reduction. Revenue synergies are tough to estimate, but expense synergies can be more grounded in reality if you do it the right way. The three pitfalls to avoid are, number one, you have to make sure your numbers are granular and are somewhat grounded in reality. Even a simple split by division is better than just simply listing a lump sum number. Pitfall number two is not factoring in the time required to realize these synergies. So you almost never want to have 100% of those synergies in year one or year two. You want to phase them in gradually over time because it does take time to restructure and reorganize the company. And then pitfall number three is there's no such thing as a free lunch. So if you have synergies or a merger at all, there are going to be costs associated with integrating both companies and restructuring them, and you need to factor that in as well. So if you keep in mind those three pitfalls and avoid them in your own models, you will be able to incorporate expense synergies much more successfully and more accurately gauge what a deal looks like and just how accretive it's going to be 
it's the buyer in that M&A deal.